Good morning again and uh, welcome to the uh, peer annual meeting. Uh, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here in uh, UCLA and uh, have this uh, year's annual meeting in one of the uh, main core uh, institutes of PEER. Uh, not only because UCLA is part of PEER, but also because this is the 25th anniversary of Northridge earthquake. So it's uh, very fitting to have that event held in, in this campus. So my name is Khaled Musallam. I am the Professor of Structural Engineering at UC Berkeley. I'm also the director of PEER uh, uh, as of a uh, couple of years ago. So before I start uh, to, to have this annual meeting held here, it took a lot of effort from uh, many people. Uh, this is the, the first row is the standing steering committee of the PEER annual meeting. The second row is the members of the steering committee who are more local to the LA area and their involvement was, was very important to get this event uh, organized. The bottom uh, row are really the heavy lifters. Uh, this is the uh, peer staff and also uh, UCLA staff. There is a little box on the side because I couldn't fit all the student helper in one slide. So, but there are many students from uh, UCLA also help uh, in organizing uh, this event. So I, I, I like to thank them all. And uh, if there is anything good uh, in this meeting, it's because of them. Anything bad, I take the blame for it. Uh, but uh, uh, they have been really uh, very helpful. So uh, a few slides about uh, Northridge since this uh, 25 years ago, exactly uh, uh, that big event happened uh, not too far from here. Uh, the losses were uh, uh, very impressive uh, in a bad way uh, and uh, many things we learned in this event uh, related to uh, soft story wood structures, related to uh, steel moment frame and fractured joints, related to non-ductile concrete buildings. Uh, so many uh, lessons learned, many consequences. Uh, impact on performance-based earthquake engineering, impact in codes and guidelines, even impact on the way we do testing and loading protocols, uh, facilities, impressive facilities that were built a few years after. Like here I put the, the San Diego shaken table which was built around the 2000, not uh, not too much time after uh, uh, Northridge and uh, uh, it's going to see another uh, big uh, up upgrade. Uh, you must have read about that. We're all looking forward to uh, uh, see that improvement. So today and tomorrow, you are going to hear a lot more about uh, Northridge, uh, what happened, what have we learned, and look into the future. So I just put uh, this quick introduction. As far as uh, peer, uh, we can claim uh, Peer had uh, a big uh, say in uh, things that happened after that. Uh, uh, Professor Maley will, will talk uh, uh, in a little while and I'm sure he's going to mention something about the older concrete buildings and the impact of that in the LA seismic safety law. Uh, so. Recently in the news, uh, you must have read about uh, Shake Alert LA. Uh, so hopefully we will hear more about that uh, tomorrow in the uh, City of LA Resiliency Panel. Uh, I'm not sure if this will be mentioned or not, but I thought uh, uh, to mention it uh, in my opening remarks. Um, so, so many things we learn about uh, from, the, from this uh, tragic event uh, and its uh, astronomical losses uh, that we can reflect upon and, and look at uh, how this changed our profession and our research. So now I turn to the main part of uh, my talk, which is to talk about peer. Uh, what is the current status? Uh, what is the vision and the mission and some of the strategic planning of PEER and a few highlights about what's currently going and uh, a brief look into uh, the future as well. 
So as a little bit of history, uh, so Pierre, as many of you know, uh, started uh, back in 1997, and it's, it's the research arm of the state of California. It is the home of earthquake engineering research in Western United States. Uh, it had major impacts uh, nationally and internationally on research, on the profession. And we do that by supporting research in transportation and lifeline, tall buildings, uh, ground motion, uh, technology uh, development, including a computational platform like OpenSeas, a uh, hybrid simulation platform like OpenFresco, uh, focused uh, software like Bridge PBEE, uh, and also dissemination of all these results in the form of reports, uh, that uh, are distributed uh, uh, worldwide and all in the public domain. Uh, also, the support of the NICE library, which even predates uh, PEER, supporting our undergraduate interns, our graduate student researchers. So, a few glimpses of uh, the last year. Uh, the Peer NICE uh, library of Peer is repeated here in the title. So uh, at the moment it has about 10,000 uh, users and members. The the e library user from Google Analytics is is very strong. A lot of interest in our collection of text images and software. Uh, so this is uh, uh, have been a good year uh, for the library. Uh, in terms of technical reports, we continue uh, supporting uh, the editing with, and with all your effort in the great research you do and the great editing of Claire Johnson, who's somewhere here. Uh, we maintain a, a very high standard in these reports and uh, we continue uh, producing them with an average of about 15 reports per year, which is very impressive considering these are thesis size uh, reports. So that's a uh, uh, pretty big productivity uh, uh, in that regard. Uh, future reports, uh, the ground motion uh, prediction and NGA database, uh, particularly NGA East, uh, the final report uh, will come out at the end of January. Uh, NGA subduction is planned uh, for uh, March 2019. A report already came out mid-2018, uh, uh, so this is something to look forward to. Uh, maybe one of those reports is going to take the prize of being the number uh, 300 report. So we have reached 299. Uh, maybe we give a prize to this who will be the number 300. Um, a few highlights about events that uh, took place uh, with the support of peer staff and also the support of uh, many of the researchers involved. The uh, Haywired workshop in January, uh, Haywired scenario uh, press conference that took place in April. Uh, this was a very nice venue in the uh, uh, press box in the uh, Berkeley Stadium. Uh, peer is, uh, is part of the... Uh, um, uh, haywired uh, coalition. Uh, we think uh, that scenario, even though it's a single scenario, it's it's a way of digging deeper uh, through research to shorten uh, the region's recovery time, which has uh, uh, which is directly related to. Uh, resiliency of our communities. Uh, other highlights, I'm sure uh, I missed the important ones, but uh, our involvement in Cal Day in the Berkeley campus, peer participation in the 11 uh, uh, National Conference on Earthquake Engineering, and also mid-year we hold our peer uh, researchers workshop. Uh, this is more of uh, exchanging research idea, more of discussion. So uh, last year in August, uh, we had that uh, important event in Richmond Field Station. It was very successful for researchers to know what their colleagues are doing and try to streamline uh, some of the activities. Uh, we also work with uh, other entities like this workshop that was with MTS. Uh, focused on uh, hybrid simulation. Uh, it was also a successful event uh, that, uh, as you know, hybrid simulation is something important. For many years, 
uh, uh, within PEER and, uh, uh, and its several uh, core institutions who have interest uh, in that uh, type of research. Uh, peer website, you may have seen that, uh, have got uh, um, a makeover uh, um, back in July. Uh, it's part now of the Berkeley uh, Drupal platform. That gives us a lot of bells and whistles, a lot of support, uh, many of the things that uh, uh, we don't need to deal with related to security, accessibility, maintenance, um, automatic features that get rolled into uh, uh, all sites, including the uh, uh, peer site, uh, so that has been useful. Uh, when you develop a, a, or revamp a website that's stagnant for many years, there is always glitches. So if you identify any glitch, please uh, let us know. There may be some broken links and things like that. W we try to iron them as we hear about them, uh, but if you find anything, please let us know. Uh, we can also look at peer analytics uh, of last year. Uh, you see a few spikes here. I tried to use my imagination to think what these spikes, these are the number of visits of our peer site. And uh, I was happy to find some correlation uh, with our events when we had the MTS peer hybrid uh, simulation workshop, there was a big spike there. Uh, when we had the haywire scenario, we had a big spike there. When we had the peer researchers workshop and the fee net challenge, which I'll talk about at the end. And also when we had the, the TSRP request for proposal release, it's not as big as I thought it would be. Uh, maybe people are not interested in funding anymore, but uh, uh, or maybe this is because it's a it's a smaller group who can apply for these uh, grants, which are only uh, peer researchers. Um, so the the continuing with the status. Uh, so today, peer uh, has eleven uh, core institutions, six educational affiliates, roughly about two hundred researchers. Uh, these researchers span a variety of expertise, uh, from geohazards, building and bridge uh, systems, network system, experimental and analytical techniques, new technologies, and with this powerhouse. Uh, we are poised to really go after uh, activities that uh, uh, guarantee to some extent a resilient design for extreme event. This is what uh, we are uh, pushing for uh, in the coming few years and also in a uh, few years past. So just to remind uh, ourselves, you may have seen this slide before, these are our uh, core members. Uh, our educational affiliate, uh, our mission is still revolve around integrated performance-based uh, engineering, uh, focused uh, towards uh, resilient design uh, in the face of extreme event. Why resiliency is important? Uh, it's, it's an obvious uh, answer to an important question because mitigation, which is part of having a resilient community, uh, pays off. And many studies have shown this is at least five to one. It could be six to one in some cases. Uh, so if you spend a dollar, you can actually get five dollars in return. Um, not only in reducing losses and downtime, but also reducing human suffering, which is something you cannot put a price on. And this five to one doesn't include that. So a uh, few more things about the, the status of uh, uh, the era we live in. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's an era where we have lots of data that are affordable, uh, that come from affordable sensors. Uh, lots of tools in high performance computing, lots of tools in artificial intelligence that have already seen uh, their applications or, or, or uh, um, uh, in areas like structure health monitoring, uh, city scale simulation, physics based ground motion modeling, and peer recognizes that uh, far reaching potential of these uh, tools. Uh, and we think if it gets, uh, it penetrates more research and practice in earthquake and other uh, extreme event, it can be very bit beneficial as long as we base this on our years of experience and development in performance-based <coughs> engineering. 
Uh, we have seen this slide many times. It's still a brilliant slide, uh, brilliant vision uh, that uh, the founders of uh, Peer uh, have envisioned. It's still valid until today. It puts things in a nice graphics form uh, that connects engineering seismology all the way to loss assessment and also has the, the mathematical flavor uh, that can dazzle people of a triple integral and all that, uh, which is still important. Important, uh, as long as we can explain it well to decision makers. Uh, for this to really happen, uh, uh, what is behind it are several enabling technologies that PEER continues to support on the analytical simulation, uh, uh, obviously <coughs> open seas, on the hybrid simulation, open fresco, and many databases uh, that we maintain and uh, 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 like to see grow even more NGA, uh, uh, cohort of NGA databases, the uh, performance, uh, the uh, structure performance database, the seismic performance observatory. And uh, again, the analytics of these is, is impressive. Uh, only last year, uh, the number of uh, page views for open seas exceeded 2 million. Uh, the number of page views of NGA uh, uh, close to 180,000. These are big numbers uh, given uh, that these are highly specialized uh, software and databases. So, so the demand is out there, the interest is out there, and if you look at the distribution, uh, it is not just uh, state of California or United States, it's actually worldwide. Uh, our mega projects are in, in different phases. Uh, TBI have matured, uh, TSRP is ongoing, it supports many research. Lifeline program is going very well, Tsunami Research Program. Uh, the CAA project, uh, which I'll say uh, we'll have one slide about, it's for quantifying performance of retrofitted and unretrofitted cripple walls and uh, cell anchorage in single family uh, wood frame buildings. Uh, the objective is to develop uh, fragility function and uh, damage modification factors that uh, modelers can use for loss estimation. Uh, last Friday, there was this test going on in, right below the peer headquarters on campus. Uh, we took these photos and I'm sure we're going to hear more about it uh, in the uh, concurrent uh, discussion tomorrow. Uh, where uh, testing and some of the progress of this uh, big project uh, will be presented. Uh, an example of a new project that get approved last week that I'd like to share with you. Uh, this is probably our largest international project uh, that we have uh, for some years. It's, uh, it's not a huge amount of money. It's only 20 million RMB. It sounds impressive, but when you convert it to dollars and RMB is not doing very well uh, for dollars, uh, uh, other reasons for that. Uh, it's still about $3 million, but what's interesting about uh, this project, it looks at uh, true resiliency research. So we take a four kilometer square in the city of Shenzhen that has a variety of facilities, uh, um, different kind of buildings, different users, and so on. And uh, the uh, China uh, Electronics Technology Group Corporation uh, is the keeper of data from many of these uh, uh, facilities that are instrumented. Right where this dot is, there is a new campus that's being built uh, that will be outfitted with many sensors. Uh, this campus is actually what is called TBSI. It's Tsinghua Berkeley Shenzhen Institute. Um, and the team that uh, won this award uh, has expertise in structure engineering, machine learning, uh, sensor network, computer simulation. And the team will basically develop the so-called digital twin of this four kilometer square with everything in it, including the trees and whatnot. Uh, and uh, the purpose is to conduct physics-based simulation, machine learning uh, techniques to create the city resiliency against extreme events. 
this will be a very nice playground to exercise many of the activities that have been developed, will be developed uh, within PEER. Uh, most of this funding can be used towards hosting collaborators and visitors. So if you have interest, you have good ideas about uh, resiliency concepts, uh, you could be hosted in this institute. Uh, you will be the guests of Tsinghua and Berkeley, and uh, uh, we can use the funding to uh, pick your brain and have you part of uh, uh, this activity. So a uh, few things about, uh, based on this status, about the vision, the mission, and the strategic plan. Uh, our vision is uh, to be the leaders in uh, resilient design for extreme events. Uh, that affect our built environment. PEER uh, will lead the research and development of new modeling analysis, assessment and design frameworks, technologies and tools to enhance the resilience of communities that are exposed to natural hazard. The mission can be twofold, uh, develop, validate and disseminate performance based engineering technologies uh, for a variety of uh, structures and systems. Uh, equip the earthquake engineering community and other uh, uh, extreme event community with tools, technologies, future workforce uh, through collaboration between peer researchers uh, uh, that I listed their uh, capacity and this capacity is really uh, uh, an impressive one. Uh, we have five strategic goals that we will work towards in, in the coming year. Uh, Capitalize on the peer institution uh, capacity to focus on multi-institution research work and interaction. Uh, continue innovative research in earthquake engineering and expand to other extreme event. Uh, develop new artificial intelligence tool for extreme events in combination with uh, physics-based analysis tool. Expand our outreach activities to increase advocacy uh, role in shaping public policy and identify and pursue, that's probably the most important one, new and large sustained funding uh, resources. Uh, our committee structure uh, that uh, we will be contacting you unless you take the first initiative and contact us and let us know uh, uh, which committee you like to be part of. Uh, of course, some of this already exists. Our institutional board uh, help us in setting the policy and the guidance of how to run the center. Our research committee uh, set the vision and goals of how funding should be distributed. But two very important committees that we would like your input on and your participation in is industry advisory board to identify what are really the important problems we should work on uh, 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 that are of interest to the engineering community. And probably the most important one is the resource identification committee. Uh, so uh, uh, we will build, we, we are not building on vacuum, we will build in our uh, friends in our business and industry partnership program. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a healthy program, uh, but uh, we are not uh, tapping into uh, uh, your knowledge and uh, uh, just going after your small membership is, is, uh, is not enough. Uh, we need uh, to do a lot more uh, in having you uh, uh, participate uh, in how the center uh, runs. We also have a long list of uh, stakeholders that come to our lab for things like service to industry, uh, some really big company, Tesla, ABB, Caterpillar, and so on. Uh, if, if I list uh, also the users of other uh, uh, labs and the uh, um, other peer campuses, uh, the list will be very long, but the interest is definitely out there. Uh, labs do not only do service to industry, we, we continue doing our research, uh, we continue our outreach to uh, um, uh, high schools and uh, junior colleges and, and, and so on. A few quick highlights, uh, new projects, um, Many things uh, now in peer have reached a steady state. Uh, they're going to be happening no matter what. For example, uh, put on your calendar, September 12 is the day we will be releasing our request for proposal. It's always going to be September 12, unless it's a weekend. Uh, 
So that's uh, that's one thing. Uh, these are uh, requests for proposal with the focus of uh, reducing impacts of earthquakes on transportation systems. Um, this year, or in the 2018 request for proposal, we get about 50 proposals uh, covering 18 of the 19 topics identified in the RFP that is span all the activities I mentioned uh, um, uh, um, that, that, that um, correlate well with the expertise that, that we have in the center. And each proposal received three independent reviews. Uh, this year, uh, 11 proposals are funded uh, was for a total of about $800,000. You can see the, the complete list on this site. It's also in our peer news. Uh, this is in addition to uh, ongoing 23 projects. Eight of them are finishing uh, uh, um, or are have been completed uh, by 2018. Uh, you will hear more about them uh, during the concurrent uh, sessions. Some new things, I mentioned the open seas, uh, the group in Oregon have been active in converting Tickle to, uh, to interface to use Python, and there is some uh, improvement on that. Uh, Python 3, a few more functionalities. Um, including uh, this in the uh, Jupyter uh, notebook is about to be released in Design Safe. Uh, so this is one uh, important uh, development. Uh, fluid structure interaction in open seas. Uh, some uh, validation of 2D uh, modeling have happened. Uh, some validation of 3D is underway using a test bed of a steel frame. Uh, um, uh, that is subjected to wave uh, wave loading in a, in a flume that's in Oregon State. Um, not only open seas is growing in capabilities, uh, but also in in terms of uh, user interfaces. So there is a new interface uh, that uh, uh, that f from Greece. Uh, and new capabilities and the new versions of OpenSea's PL for uh, uh, pile uh, ground interaction. Uh, there is an educational version of that. Some new products uh, like Peer BBE, PBE uh, that was released at the end of 2017. Uh, now uh, that is uh, uh, has a, a, a multi-span version, uh, MS Bridge. Uh, which is a graphical user interface for uh, seismic analysis of multi-span bridge ground systems uh, that integrates uh, peer performance-based earthquake engineering framework. Um, it's the, the manual is online and you can read more about that. has a few important capabilities, uh, modeling curved bridges, uh, modeling bridges with uh, multiple columns in bends, uh, looking or having several uh, uh, PY uh, springs uh, of a variety of capabilities. Uh, so this is uh, thanks to the group in, in uh, UC San Diego uh, in making this uh, improvement. Uh, the last part here, because I have only a few more uh, minutes left, is uh, I would like to highlight the peer uh, interaction with the natural hazards engineering research infrastructure. For those who do not know, uh, this is an NSF uh, national facility that provide the engineering community with research infrastructure uh, to protect homes, businesses, infrastructure, lifelines from earthquakes and also wind storms. Uh, three of uh, these sites are peer core institution, uh, UC San Diego, Oregon State, and UC Berkeley through the Sim Center. Uh, this is, uh, goes without saying that peer interaction uh, with this infrastructure is a must, and there are uh, a few examples of that. Uh, the newly formed network for a structure extreme event reconnaissance. Uh, is an integral part of NERI, and PEER is the earthquake node uh, uh, for this network. Uh, we have been uh, learning from our colleagues in uh, wind and storms how rapid they respond and produce uh, uh, virtual uh, reports, produce field reports, which something from my humble experience hasn't been happening in earthquake engineering community that rapid. 
we go do reconnaissance and I remember the first reconnaissance professor Meili asked me to go to Turkey I was still a uh, uh, junior faculty the earthquake happened in uh, I forgot 1999 or something the report came out 2000 so a year later which we thought wow that's fast uh, actually our goal in STEER is to have the report coming out within four days so that's that's different that is something gear have been doing uh, in the geotechnical uh, uh, arena but for structures I can claim this is new and uh, some of these reports we started uh, in October and we have about eight or nine reports already out one on Haiti earthquake the Alaska earthquake I took some leadership on that and it came out within a week uh, just one warning the recording on this report is wrong you have to divide by two there was a glitch there and once you get a DOI you cannot change the report unfortunately um, many tools are uh, developed uh, within the SIM Center that we are promoting through our request for proposals, uh, earthquake engineering, uh, uncertainty quantification, finite element un uncertainty quantification, PBE, uh, other tools, multi-degree of freedom, modular, uh, earthquake versus wind, uh, brace the frame model, uh, pile group tools, and uh, if you read our RFP carefully, uh, you see we are promoting these tools for your proposal to be successful. Uh, please make use of them. Lastly, uh, uh, our education uh, activities in peer is growing. Uh, we have many uh, interns, uh, current interns, summer interns. We have a joint program with Columbia. Uh, and uh, also through TBSI, uh, we host many students uh, that they come from different parts of the world. They get involved in many of our activities. Uh, some of them even participate in uh, producing some of these uh, uh, rapid reports of uh, STEER. Uh, I will talk more about these coming four slides, so I'll just flash them uh, in front of you because we have a very important event at the end of today. Please don't miss it. Uh, this is uh, the event where uh, distribute awards of our blind prediction winners. Uh, also, uh, I want to draw your attention to our poster session uh, that has some uh, very interesting posters. This particular poster uh, of laser-based settlement uh, uh, measurement of bridges uh, for improved uh, decision making has some relevance to this blind prediction uh, contest that we have the winner of this contest and the second and third place in the room. Uh, we will announce that at the end of the day. And lastly, our first uh, uh, machine learning uh, challenge that we call the FeeNet uh, 2018 challenge. Fee stand for Peer Hub ImageNet. Uh, was incredibly successful. Uh, th that's the least I can say about it. Uh, when we have 68 teams uh, worldwide participating, more than uh, 200 uh, researchers involved, to try to identify damage from photos, uh, that's a great participation. And uh, we also have uh, the two winners uh, in the room. We will announce that and they will receive their trophies, which they will look like this. Uh, very nicely designed uh, trophies. Uh, one for the engineering group uh, and the other is for the computer scientist uh, group. Uh, and uh, finally, I wish you an enjoyable uh, peer annual meeting. Uh, and we will move on uh, to the next presentation. Uh, so this, I'll, I'll moderate uh, this session. In this session, we have three talks uh, that focus on Northridge. Uh, we will start with the uh, geohazard. Uh, Norma Abrahamson doesn't really need introduction, uh, so I'm going to spare uh, the long introduction so we can listen to him. Uh, so he will tell us about the uh, things related to ground motion. The next talk will talk about structures and then we will end up with the big picture of resiliency and lessons learned from uh, Northridge. Nor
this work? Yeah. Okay, good morning. Um, I am now officially an old person because I'm here to talk to you about something that happened 25 years ago and um, I've moved to history mode. So uh, tomorrow I get to tell you about the future. Now I'm going to tell you about the past. Um, so Northridge, uh, this is just a plot of um, the Northridge earthquake. So you've got the rupture zone here. This is going to work. Um, and then a lot of uh, ground motion recordings. Most of the ground motion recordings are to the uh, southeast there in the, in the basins where we have structures and we put recordings. But there were um, recordings up in the mountains as well. So this was a, a big step forward for us. If you look at the data set that we had before Northridge, which was the blue, um, and then the Northridge earthquake there is the uh, red uh, ones. We added uh, a lot of recordings, um, sort of in this uh, six to 50 kilometer range. And then there were the orange ones are some of the aftershocks from Northridge. The key here though is that um, this had some other features that were different for us. And I'll talk about the things that changed ground motion models. So if you go back to the 90s, ground motion models were very simple. You could program them up on a spreadsheet in 10 or 15 minutes. There was maybe seven parameters in them and they were uh, very easy to do. Um, that's not the case anymore. We, I don't even have students try to program up the new models because it's, it's almost hopeless. Um, but the key things we started with is here, this was a blind <coughs> fault. Okay, it's a, and we had a buried rupture, and we didn't really know how to deal with that in the ground motion models. They had no parameter for that. They had magnitude and distance, and they had a style of faulting, whether it was reverse or strike slip, and they would also have a soil category, right? So we put things into classes of, of deep soils, and we put them into soft soil, which we didn't deal with, and everything else we called rock. Okay, so you need to keep that sort of in mind as to what we were doing. Other key things that happened were hanging wall effects. We didn't have these at all in our ground motion models. This turned out to be a huge limitation of what was there before. Um, also, we started to see large variations in the ground motion of what we thought were short distances. Stations a few kilometers apart are completely different in their ground motion amplitude. Even when they started to look at aftershock recordings spaced maybe 10 to 100 meters apart, and again, the ground motions were very different. Um, then we went to as well, nonlinear side effects um, were beginning to be brought into the ground motion models. Uh, and the, the factors that we use um, after Northridge are very different. And then there's, uh, we're getting velocity pulses in these data. Uh, we have basin effects, and I'll talk a little bit about vertical ground motions. The last three there, I'm not gonna talk as much about, so it'll be a higher level. So if you went to Northridge and you said, what do we do first thing in those days? We plot up the peak acceleration versus distance and we compare our curves to them. And you'd say, all right, on average, these things were 50% higher than what our model said it should be. So why is that? And so we go, well, it's a berry fault. We haven't had those before. Is that what was the cause? Or was it because it was actually on a blind fault that doesn't reach to the surface? So. Um, the idea being there's higher stress drops um, from those types of earthquakes. Or the other parameter we had in our models to tweak was a style of faulting factor. That is, is reverse earthquakes stronger compared to strike slip than we had thought in the past. Okay, so then when we start to look at what's happening now, our models uh, that we use now, almost all of them will include some sort of depth scaling. Um, uh, they scale either on the top of the rupture or the hypocentral depth. Uh, two of the NGA uh, West 2 models don't have depth scaling terms in them. There is, however, a trade-off between the depth scaling and, and the style of faulting terms. And that's because reverse earthquakes tend to be deeper than strike-slip earthquakes. So now I could model these effects in either way. I could shove them all into a style of faulting term or I can <coughs> uh, put them into a depth term. If you look at how these models look like now, a depth scaling term, this is typical of uh, what we use. This is the, how the earthquake term would increase as you get to deeper and deeper ruptures. The Northridge event is a red 
uh, circ or square put on there, so it's an above average earthquake. In our current models, we'd only count for about half of that above average ground motion due to the depth, and the other half would be something else, okay? Uh, uh, sort of a random behavior here. But as we get deeper and deeper earthquakes, we get bigger factors. So these factors are 0.7 on this scale. Here's a factor of two in ground motion. So we're gonna start to get big differences in how the ground motion scale. The other thing about this is once we start to say earthquakes that are deeper are more energetic, we get to a problem or an issue that putting the rupture at the closest point to your site doesn't always lead to the largest ground motions. All right, because now in this simple case here, um, up here on the top, I have a vertical fault and I'm gonna put a magnitude six uh, and a half earthquake on there. If I put it all the way to the surface, the closest point to the site there, and calculate the ground motions, that's the blue curve on the right hand side. And on the bottom here, if I take that rupture and push it down, it's a little bit further away, but it's deeper, my ground motions go up. So now the, your deterministic analysis gets a little more complicated because closer isn't always larger. All right, so in a probabilistic analysis, this is easy. The computer will do all that stuff for you. We now have to pay a little bit more attention to when we do deterministic studies. The biggest change really from the ground motion models due to Northridge was the hanging wall effect, okay? And so this is just a sketch here. If I have a, a rupture shown by the, the solid line there, this is in cross section of a fault, <coughs> a dipping fault. If I had two stations here, one on the left and one on the right, they're the same distance away from the rupture and as measured as closest distance, but the one on the hanging wall side on the right is closer to a lot more of the rupture than the one on the left. So just for a purely geometrical reason, we have a large increase in the ground motions on the right-hand side compared to the left-hand side at the same distance. Okay. Those factors get large. This is the data that we had in Northridge. So this is the first time we had this kind of data to work with where we had, um, that's the rupture shown there. The hanging wall side is on the bottom. The foot wall side is on the left. And we actually had recordings on both the foot wall and the hanging wall side close in. That hasn't been the case in the past. So we didn't have the data to see what's going on. Right now, we have still only a handful of earthquakes with the data on both the foot wall and the hanging wall. And there's really four of them that are useful at this point. So we're still at the point where this is an important factor for us. Using the data that was available from Northridge, what's shown on the x-axis is um, from the, uh, the rupture distance, but keeping track of it, whether you're on the foot wall side, which is negative, or on the hanging wall side, which is positive. And the circles there are the residuals. That's the misfit of a model that was fit to Northridge data compared to the observation. And on the right-hand side, they tend to be positive, right? But there's not a whole lot there. There's a lot of scatter. We went ahead and said, we can draw a line through those points, okay? So uh, we did that. That corresponds to about a 50% increase in the ground motion uh, when you're over the hanging wall side. This was all there was to work with at the time. Okay, we were data poor and we make models in charge forward. This model has held up remarkably well. Okay, actually, if I was to repeat this, Calculation today, that, that 0.4 uh, um, natural log units, about 50% increase, still is what about what we get today with our current models. Okay. If you do this and apply it into your um, ground motion model, we came up with these now attenuation relations. The black curve would be a typical model that we would make, and the dash curve is how we increase it if you're sitting on the hanging wall side. So we still have not a lot of data, okay? And so these are all the earthquakes we had through NGA West 2 that had some recordings close in, uh, um, either within 15 kilometers, um, both, and we're looking at the hanging wall and the foot wall side. So we need at least one on each side. But you can see most of those numbers on the right hand, so the third column over here is how many are at a joint of board distance of zero. That means they're sitting right on top of the rupture. Okay, and there's only a couple of earthquakes, about four of them, that's got more than one recording over the top of the rupture. 
the two main earthquakes that have data for us are Chi Chi and Northridge, and then we go to uh, Wenchuan and Lakula to try to get something to work with. That's all there is. Okay, so to help us out, we have to do, so if we plot the data from these, on the bottom here is the uh, cross-section of the uh, uh, fault, and on the top are residuals again, and you can see if they're at zero, then we have no effect. When we're over the hanging wall, we only have a few recordings, but they tend to be high. Okay? If you're basing all this on statistical significance, you wouldn't do anything with this. This is four data points out of 10,000 that might be in your model. But we're not trying to build models based on statistical significance. We're trying to build models to capture a physical behavior that's important. Okay, so now the question is, does this physical behavior make sense? But we see an increase here for uh, Chi Chi on the left, uh, Northridge on the right, and the other couple earthquakes, these are other two good ones, Lakwala, not a lot to work with on the left, and then Wenchuan on the right. Okay, so, but they all tend to show an increase there. What gives us confidence in this is not that we're fitting 10 data points and trying to get a number, is that we start to now run numerical simulations where we can run thousands of realizations of these earthquakes and look at what the behavior is expected to be. So these are finite fault simulations that are run. Each, each uh, gray point there is a simulation uh, calculation. The black line is what you would get if you had no hanging wall effects. The ground motion is the same on the foot wall or the hanging wall. Most of our data are on foot wall, close in. You tend to put your cities and your locations of stations on the flat part, right? And you don't stick them up in the mountain. So we have a lot more data there. So our ground motion models tend to be foot wall based models. And now we're gonna look at increasing them. So the key is there's a big scatter in any individual point. If I only had two or three data points on the right hand side, that's what we've been trying to fit, right? So we can't control or, or uh, constrain the scaling really with distance very well or with magnitude or with dip of the earthquake in depth. All these things start to affect it. So we have to use numerical simulations to constrain all of that. Um, so from that we have uh, magnitude scaling, dip scaling, depth to top scaling, and <laughs> Rx is this is the distance perpendicular to strike. That you can now make a model that makes physical sense and is consistent with those data. As you start to put that model in, the ground motion models are no longer a simple seven parameters that you can code up in a little bit. They're starting to get more complicated as we try to impose physical behavior into effectively polynomials, right? How many polynomials do you need to match this numerical simulation behavior? Another issue at, for, um, from Northridge was some big recordings, particularly Tarzana, one of our really large recordings. So we're up to about 5G spectral acceleration there in the middle of the period range. At the time, the black line was a median model we've been using, and the 84th percentile is the dash line, and we're way above that, right? So this is a really big ground motion, and people spend a lot of time sort of looking at this one and trying to understand it. Um, uh, this is from Paul Spudich. Several, there's several studies that were trying to look at this. He's looking over here on the right hand side. TAR is Tarzana. Um, it's, here's the rock and it's going into the uh, sediments there. And there's nearby stations V10 and then ENL. So these are a few kilometers apart. However, the differences in the ground motions are large. So if we look at these ground motions here, the you plotted up seismograms, they don't look so different. The three verticals, the three east-west and the three north-south. But to do that, he had to multiply V10 by three and ELN by six to make them look similar. Okay, so there's a huge increase in this compared to what you get a few kilometers away. They went further and looked at the Tarzana station, which is the black dot here, and it's on a little topographic feature. And then during, for aftershocks, they put out all of these stations shown by the open circles and started to see tremendous variability in the ground motion over tens to hundreds of meters. Okay, so we ha um, they work out seismological reasons for why this happens, what's happening in some detailed basin, shallow basin structure here, or geologic structure. 
You can find that out afterwards, but we don't know this ahead of time. Right? If you're going to put a structure here, we wouldn't have, have known that this is going to be three times or four times higher than a typical site. Okay? So our ground motion data sets are severely spatially aliased. Right? We don't really sample what's out there. <coughs> And we're at the mercy of whether we're sort of on the highs or lows as, as we're going forward. So starting to find ways to bring in more dense samplings of data um, is even from smaller earthquakes will help us. Another issue from Northridge was basin effects. I'm not going to talk much about this. The seismology community spends a lot of time on now doing, uh, taking these kinds of data, building 3D or 2D or 3D geologic crustal models. Uh, calculating the response uh, using analytical wave propagation and then comparing that to the data. So then there's large effects that they can say a particular station is going to be high for an earthquake in this one spot. If the earthquake is in a different spot, you can get a very different distribution of the highs and lows. So it's complicated. When we build this into empirical models, we had to simplify that tremendously. Okay, and we simplified it to simple scale factors based on basin depth. That was the thing that, that at least a first order could distinguish between a soil site that has a shallow soil site or a soil site that's in a deep alluvial basin. This scaling though, scaling with Z 1.0 or 2.5, so the depth to one or kilometer per second or two and a half kilometers per second, varies by region. This depends on uh, basically the, the velocity structure. So you can't take these models and really move them around. The newer ground motion models are developing region by region uh, basin scaling terms. And that's sort of the complexity that's going to start to happen in all these models is recognizing this isn't all a uh, simple ergodic model, but we're going to have to do something more complicated. So after Northridge, what have we been doing? There, we've been running or using 3D numerical simulations for basins. However, there's an issue of how do you tie simulations together with an empirical model? And the problem we face is that our empirical models already have an average basin effect in them. They're not 1D models. They don't represent ground motion in a 1D model. They represent the average of a 3D Earth. So the 3D effects are correlated to the shear wave velocity models that we have. Right, so we already have basin effects implicitly on average built into our VS30 scaling in the ground motion model. So to avoid double <coughs> counting those pieces, we have to use an average reference as an average depth of the basin for each VS30 that is in our generic model and then look, look at deviations from that. We can't take 3D simulations divided by a 1D simulation and use those numbers. Okay, that's what had first happened when we started to use have simulations done and you looked at it and go these don't fit together so now we have methods to try to make this all sort of uh, 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 fit in a, in a reasonable way so nonlinear site response I'll talk just briefly about but in after the Loma Prieta earthquake we had a lot of data uh, on soil sites and were able to really evaluate nonlinear effects empirically really with a good data set for the first time um, and those site factors got built into the building code. After Northridge, when they looked at the site response, it wasn't consistent with that model post Loma Prieta. And there was a project called Resolution of Site Response Issues in the Northridge Earthquake, so ROSRIN was the acronym, um, and basically found that the soils in this region were more linear in their behavior than the soils in uh, the Bay Area region from Loma Prieta. So that changed the way we started modeling things. Um, this isn't my field, but uh, those of you geotechs will recognize GOG max curves. The top ones are um, curves that were based on Loma Prieta. On the bottom ones, these are all cohesionless soil curves based on Northridge. The bottom ones are more linear. Um, if you look at the curves, they're higher up than what the curves are on um, the GOG max don't fall as fast. So we have more linear models. These are now more consistent with the empirical data around the world. So this is actually a better average nonlinear behavior than we have for uh, the models used in the Bay Area. Okay, 
Last peak velocities, we got large peak velocities in Northridge in close 100 centimeters per second in multiple recordings. If we look at um, data, this is just actually pulled out of the pure ground motion database, so you can make these same plots. At um, Rinaldi receiving station, we have a nice velocity pulse, right? 140 centimeters per second, so a very big velocity packed in a small amount of time with a really simple waveform. So this is one of the classic records that we end up using for uh, um, uh, trying to find a, a near fault uh, <coughs> recording. Verticals, um, right after the earthquake, uh, we, there was re reports coming out, oh, we have several recordings over 1G vertical, and what does that mean? And there was uh, talk about, oh, was, uh, was damage here related to the verticals instead of related to the horizontals, because the verticals were high. Really, they're high, the verticals are large, but the horizontals are larger, okay? And so this isn't a case of large verticals, it's a case of large horizontals. If we look at the horizontal to vertical ratio from Northridge, this is data within 15 kilometers. You look at this, and this is a typical looking V over H ratio shape. It comes in at peaks just below 0.1 second, it has a trough, and then comes across. So it's not verticals were big or unusual, you just had a large horizontal, of, that, of which they went with. So, what are we trying to deal with going forward? Um, depth scaling, that's now part of ground motion models and I think that's here to stay, that will tie more with seismology as they start to look at stress drops of earthquakes and we can make this a more physical process. Hanging wall scaling is really important, it's a factor up to a factor of two in the short period ground motions when you're close into faults. Uh, we tend to put our dams where we have topography, which is from faults, so they're almost always sitting on top of our, our hanging wall. Uh, basin factors are now again becoming common, uh, and nonlinear site factors here, uh, we're going to find we're using the nonlinear factors that are consistent with the uh, Northridge soils, but that means our GMPEs factors are not consistent with what we're using in the Bay Area, right? We're using an average. We're not using a model that's uh, um, optimized for the Bay Area. So the, again, the regional factors are closer to the Northridge earthquake. Okay, tomorrow I get to tell you something new as opposed to something old, all right? So thank you. Thank you very much, Norm. Uh, any quick question for Norm? I will be not staying today, but I'll be here all day tomorrow. So save your questions for me for tomorrow. Okay, you all can right? save the question for tomorrow then. Right. He's giving another talk tomorrow. Yeah. So we're gonna give more tomorrow. Thanks. Uh, our next speaker again doesn't need uh, really much introduction. Jack Laney, professor at UC Berkeley and the founding director of PEER. And he will also tell us about mm -hmm. Northridge, but yeah. okay. maybe more focused on structure. Yes. Uh, Norm, before you leave, I've been an old guy for a long time, so so welcome to the club. Uh, I, I remember the earthquake uh, not as well as I ought to probably, but I remember Tarzana. Uh, there was a nursery at Tarzana, and at the nursery there was row upon row of small plants in their little five-gallon pots, and it was remarkable to see the apparently the variation of ground motion at this one site because you'd find a, a row of things down and then everything up and then another row down and I don't know whether that's ever been fully studied. <laughs> um, it's been studied. But, but you'll be around tomorrow. <laughs> we'll talk tomorrow about it. And, and you know I did come down for the earthquake and we brought many students down with us and uh, had many really interesting experiences down here. And we uh, did write a report uh, it came out uh, in print form and went in the uh, U.S. Post Office mailings uh, seven days after the earthquake because that's how things were done back then in, in print reports. We didn't have the internet quite the same way we have it today. Uh, so things were really very different then. And I, I want to start out with a little bit of context. Uh, <laughs> You know, we were all very different people back then. And <laughs> I figure this is somebody that many of us uh, from the West Coast know somewhat well. 
Uh, and you know, so we were different. We had uh, different ideas about things. We grew up to be very different people. Uh, and so you put, put put yourself back 25 years ago and, and think about what engineering was like. Uh, you know, back then we talked about true lies, and today we talk. Well, let, let's talk at the reception about that. <laughs> uh, we had the uniform building code that we were designing structures to, and this this was pre strength-based design really for earthquakes and so you know this is way back um, many of you probably don't even know what the uniform building code is and this thing pier didn't exist this was our first logo pier did not exist it was an idea uh, that we sort of had in mind but really hadn't come to fruition yet uh, I want to uh, take that perspective and go back to uh, 1994 and talk about a variety of structures and you know, 20 minutes isn't enough time to do justice to uh, the great variety of things that we saw in this earthquake. I'll start out with bridges because uh, this being Los Angeles, um, we know how important the highways are uh, and have experienced that in the last couple of days especially. Uh, but uh, first thing we heard about uh, was that some of the highways were down. And you know many uh, bridges, overpasses were down around the region as shown on the left. And one of the most important that came down was the Interstate 5 State Road 14 interchange and you know this was one of the main transit routes for a lot of the, the commuters coming into the city so it was big news when this thing came down if you look at the, uh, the uh, shape the configuration of the structure you can see there's a valley and uh, very tall columns as the structure crosses the valley and then the columns get shorter shorter and shorter and of course uh, the shorter columns are more stiff and as the structure moves during the earthquake uh, the short columns attract greater forces and fail earlier and of course that's what happened here and today we talk about that as if it's a routine idea but back in 1994 displacement based design was kind of not that well known and not that well applied so we were living in a very different time then uh, but uh, there were studies done on this uh, structure to identify that indeed over uh, by the short piers it appeared <coughs> that was what triggered the failure loss of the vertical load capacity there uh, brought down some of these uh, other spans and you know we learned a lot from this about uh, different stiffness on uh, you know, unbalanced uh, bridge structures a lot about uh, how hinge restrainers work or how they don't work when they're not completely fully implemented uh, as occurred in some of the cases here uh, and so you know this was a, a great lesson in in bridge engineering about uh, the importance of paying attention to displacements and the hinge restrainers and unbalanced structures and so forth. We uh, learned in bridge construction a lot about uh, unexpected plastic hinge locations. The engineers were assuming plastic hinges formed in certain ways. Uh, they don't necessarily form in that way if you don't build the structure really in accordance with uh, uh, what the behavior is. And so we had problems where there were some uh, walls built that uh, restrained the plastic hinge zones of columns and the failures occurred above there where the confinement was not so great. Uh, there were flared column failures where the, the belief was the flare would fall off and expose the confined region and it, it doesn't work that way. So there are lots of little details that were learned about. Very importantly we learned in this earthquake uh, that the steel jackets that were just beginning to be used for retrofitting uh, re older reinforced concrete bridges, they really worked. There were several uh, uh, bridges that had uh, wrap columns, uh, as in the case on the right, that performed well. I don't know any examples where the, the columns uh, performed poorly uh, during this earthquake, but there were many examples where uh, retrofitting had not yet taken place, uh, where shear failures and axial load failures did occur. And so you know, this was, uh, I think, a, a big trigger and uh, led to an impetus for Caltrans to accelerate uh, its bridge retrofitting uh, throughout the state because it was clear it worked and it was clear what happened uh, when uh, retrofitting wasn't uh, systematically carried out uh, throughout the bridge structures. This was a, a, a very important event for, for Caltrans and uh, moved bridge construction along quickly. Uh, Ian Buckles, uh, the person I went to to get information about bridges and, and Ian has a wealth of information I have 20 minutes <laughs> so, so there's so much that happened so I have to move to buildings right away uh, building damage like bridge damage was widely distributed throughout the region 
Uh, each one of these dots uh, is a red dot is a, a location of a damaged uh, building. Uh, and they were of many, many types. No, no type of structure uh, that I'm aware of escaped uh, some damage. Let's go through some of the different examples. Uh, older existing concrete construction. Uh, there were several examples of older concrete buildings. And we're talking about buildings that are from uh, the 1970s and earlier uh, that don't have the kinds of details we put into these buildings today. And you know, the Van Nuys Holiday Inn was a classic example of column shear failures where a building was on the verge, I think, of collapsing. Uh, but the damage uh, stopped. It was halted because the shaking stopped. I think a, a, a few more seconds of shaking may well have brought this building down. That building became a subject of great study uh, within the Pacific Earthquake Engineering Research Center. It was one of the test bed buildings that guided lots of research. Um, this building on the right uh, sustained some column failures, but also beam column joint failures. And uh, the occurrence of these failures resulted in the Pacific Earthquake Engineering Research Center putting a main focus on buildings and a main focus on older non-ductile concrete buildings. And that eventually led to many, many things. Uh, models that are now in open seas for uh, representing these kinds of behaviors through shear failure to axial collapse. Uh, these models are now uh, implemented in various documents that structural engineers are using. Uh, ASCE 41, FEMA 178 just came out. Uh, ordinances in, in many of our cities now are beginning to look at these kinds of buildings. And I think uh, the Northridge earthquake had a lot to do with spurring on those studies. Uh, concrete gravity framing was covered in our building codes at the time, uh, but it was covered very lightly. And uh, practicing engineers uh, didn't uniformly address the provisions that were in the building code. It was not uncommon for uh, in, in a structure like this for the gravity framing design to be done back on the east coast somewhere and the seismic framing design to be done on the west coast and the gravity framing was incompatible. Uh, a result of this uh, type of damage which occurred over and over again in uh, especially parking structures was that the building code provisions were updated to focus more clearly on the requirements for gravity framing columns and engineers began to more carefully implement those uh, requirements in their building designs. And so that was a, a major change in the practice for buildings. Uh, concrete diaphragms suffered lots of damage and contributed to the collapse of some buildings, especially if we had uh, precast uh, diaphragms, uh, precast uh, top diaphragms. Uh, this is one example where the seismic force resisting system did great. Uh, in fact, hardly a crack could be found in the shear walls that uh, provided the lateral bracing for the building, but the diaphragms fell apart. And uh, when the diaphragms come apart, of course, you, you lose the ability to transfer the forces uh, through the system. Uh, and you know, this changed uh, design practice uh, in the United States uh, because it put a new attention on the importance of designing diaphragms properly. Uh, provisions today in our building codes, uh, you know, in the ACI uh, building code, we have a complete chapter on diaphragms and several pages uh, in the seismic chapter addressing how to detail each of these. And several projects uh, have now been carried out to understand what the real research requirements are for these kinds of elements. And you know, one of the reasons we have a problem with diaphragms in the U.S. is because we have so few and widely spaced vertical <laughs> elements, but we'll come back to that. Diaphragms were also a problem in other kinds of structures. Uh, we don't talk much about uh, these today, but uh, looking back at my notes, uh, we had failures in over 200 tilt-up buildings uh, where there are stiff perimeter walls and very flexible wood diaphragms. And failure of the connections occurred in over 200 of these buildings. And this led to very substantial changes in our building codes on the design force levels for these kinds of buildings. Very important change that came about. Wood frame construction. Uh, it was common to think that wood frame construction was safe. We didn't have to worry too much about it. There was a good history with these buildings. 
Uh, but Northridge showed us something a little different. Uh, 24 out of 25 casualties in this earthquake were caused by uh, building damage in wood frame construction. Uh, more than uh, half of the $40 billion in property damage uh, was in these buildings. And functionality, uh, you're probably way ahead of me reading this already, so I don't need to go into that. This led to a series of projects uh, that were carried out uh, throughout the United States, projects still underway today, uh, fund funded by the California Earthquake Authority to understand the design requirements for these kinds of structures. And there's lots of guidance now available and many programs underway. Uh, types of structures uh, that are wood frame that we're familiar with, uh, the uh, structures, multi-family units that have uh, tuck under parking or other soft stories, Several collapse examples occurred there. There are now programs in uh, some of our cities to address those directly. Uh, hillside homes suffered many failures. Uh, we now have much improved guidance on how to address uh, these structures. Uh, and we'd always known about unbraced uh, or unbolted cripple walls. And it, they uh, continued through this earthquake and they continue today to be a, a source of, of damage, uh, not usually casualties. Uh, I'm going to combine hospitals and non-structural into one slide because they kind of conveniently <coughs> work together. Uh, in 1971, the new Olive View Hospital uh, was shaken by a very strong near-field impulsive kind of ground motion. Uh, and that new hospital uh, had collapses in several portions of the structure and severe damage in other portions. And uh, that uh, event contributed significantly to the development of the 1973 Hospital Seismic Safety Act that requires hospitals to be designed and constructed to withstand a major earthquake and remain operational. 1994 occurs, there's the new Olive View Hospital, a structure performed beautifully. That's a photograph uh, afterwards. But that's only part of the story, of course. Um, when we look at the performance of hospitals in this earthquake, uh, we can look at the, the types of damage. Uh, the pre-act buildings are in this column and the post-1973 act buildings are in the right-hand column. If we look at structural damage, uh, red tank buildings, none from the post-act buildings, uh, and, uh, but several older buildings uh, did have structural damage. So it looks like the pre like, like the 1973 act was pretty effective until we look down at non-structural damage. And then the picture changes just a little bit. Uh, uh, if we look at major <laughs> and minor damage conditions, you know, many of the post-act buildings sustained non-structural damage. And you know, this damage is the kind of damage that easily puts a hospital out of operation, even if the structure is still intact. And so this, uh, brought a new focus on to non-structural and additional requirements for hospital design. Uh, today we have a much, much greater focus in our structural design practices on uh, the design of non-structural elements and non-structural systems because they can uh, be as important to the function of the building as the structure, if not more important. And in most of our buildings, uh, the value of these items is far greater than the value of the structure itself. Steel buildings. Well, by the time we had finished our one week report uh, and we're, we're mailing it out, we started hearing whisperings, but it was too late to figure out what was going on. We started hearing something had happened to steel buildings. And it wasn't until about five weeks after the earthquake that uh, this little graphic appeared in a Los Angeles Times uh, article. Uh, darn those LA Times people. <laughs> uh, but uh, showing <coughs> problems with uh, steel moment frames. And you know, the problem with the steel moment frames is you know, there were no collapses. Uh, there were few buildings that showed any residual signs uh, of the earthquake. Uh, the damage was often hidden behind cladding, uh, behind floor finishes and the wall finishes and so forth. And it wasn't until you started looking uh, that you started finding things. And the kinds of things found were you know, cracks, uh, welding cracks uh, in girders, 
Uh, sometimes the cracks extended into the column web. Sometimes they went all the way through the column. Uh, and uh, you know, then there were uh, cracks also, base plates, and uh, a variety of other things uh, that occurred. Uh, the result of this, one of the results of this was the SAC joint venture. And the SAC joint venture was a very important activity in that it brought together practicing structural engineers with researchers uh, in structural engineering and researchers on risk and reliability and materials experts. Uh, and they really did, I hate to use the word holistic, but it was a pretty holistic study of what the design requirements were for structural steel buildings, uh, backed up by good mathematics and analytics backed up by physical testing on full-scale systems. And uh, much of what was done to develop the design guidance here really underpins the basic methodology of the Pacific Earthquake Engineering Research Center. Uh, much of it came out of this, and so it really came out of the Northridge earthquake. Uh, I asked Jim Malley about codes for steel design. It says, before Northridge, the 1985 UBC for ductile moment frames was covered in one page. Jim says, those were the days. <laughs> uh, steel moment frames in 1992, there was an effort um, to develop provision. I think Igor Popoff was leading uh, this effort, four and a half pages. So things were, were coming. Um, <laughs> then we get to the sort of current states. And you know, we're talking about 20 pages on moment frames. Uh, there's a new AISC 341, 356 pages. I mean, the world has changed quite a bit. When I asked Jim, can you characterize simply uh, what's changed since the Northridge earthquake? And he responds always in one word, everything. Uh, so everything changed with regard to steel construction after the Northridge earthquake. So it was a monumental event. A few concluding slides related to context. Uh, Performance-based design was an idea that engineers had at the time. Uh, it was being implemented. No one knew quite how to do it, but it was the start in a project called ASC, ATC 33, which later became ASCE 41, the standard for performance-based seismic design and evaluation of existing buildings. So that was there when the earthquake occurred, and of course it was influenced by that earthquake. Uh, performance-based design for new buildings, uh, there was an effort by FEMA to develop an action plan. It was at that time through the Earthquake Engineering Research Center at Berkeley, and we were having our workshop one week after the earthquake uh, when I first heard those whispers. Uh, but SEAC had a Vision 2000 that it was working on, which uh, eventually became quite influential, uh, it was, but again, influenced very strongly by what happened during the earthquake. Uh, the SEAC Seismology Committee was working to convert the UBC to a strength basis at that time. And it was intended to be kind of a little tweak here and there, not too much going on. Uh, it, that changed quite a bit. And AISC was struggling with this dual certified steel <coughs> and, and how to do capacity designs properly with this thing. Ask Jim Malley about that. Uh, what happened in some of these activities after the earthquake? Well. The scope of the UBC conversion changed dramatically. One of the things we observed after the earthquake is that a lot of the damage that occurred in buildings occurred because the seismic framing was concentrated in relatively few elements. And this led to uh, uh, larger forces in diaphragms, uh, larger elements, many other things happened. Uh, the UBC introduced for the first time a redundancy factor because of this earthquake. Uh, in tilt-up buildings, uh, the diaphragm forces changed dramatically. Uh, we got uh, near-fault effects into the uh, seismic design uh, provisions. Uh, spectral shape changed. Minimum base shear was changed in the code because of this earthquake. Uh, and there were prohibitions introduced uh, to restrict certain kinds of irregularities that were in buildings. Uh, the FEMA SAC project, uh, I've talked a little bit about already, but uh, you know, this introduced in many ways the methodology that Peer now uses today uh, in its uh, performance-based approaches. And then in terms of performance-based design, 
Uh, it was very strongly influenced by the observations from the Northridge earthquake in terms of uh, kinds of damage, ways of assessing and upgrading building codes and the like. Uh, Vision 2000 was finished, it was very influential in, in guiding uh, development of these kinds of documents. ATC 33 was finished, FEMA P695, a method for estimating R factor or determining R factors in the codes. Uh, this really uh, all contributed to peers' focus on performance-based design. Uh, the ATC 58 project really fell out of what peer developed as its methodology and the TBI guidelines, and, and this will go on and on. I think the impact uh, from peer uh, will be felt for another generation, and I hope it's still remembered uh, way beyond that. Uh, I uh, was around for the Northridge earthquake, but it's 25 years ago, and I'm one of these old guys. I don't remember everything, so I went to friends who are experts in the, in the field. Uh, who contributed a lot to the ideas and the topics that I presented. <coughs> so my, my thanks to them, and thanks for your attention. <laughs> One quick question for Jack. I'll comment. Um, you know, I started practicing structural engineering in 1998, and it was only a, a year or two after I started practicing that these code provisions that were inspired by Northridge, particularly the near fault factor, the increased anchorage force, and the redundancy factor, uh, got actually into the structural practice. So I want to say that was probably 1999. So that was talked about the time that it takes to publish reports versus the time it takes for practicing engineers to be required to implement that. Yeah, but it, and, and it takes uh, a few years after that 1999 code comes out for it to be adopted and actually get used by engineers, so it's even a longer profile. Thanks. Well, in the interest of time, we will move on. Uh, so the, again, the, the next speaker doesn't need uh, much introduction. Uh, Mary Camario is professor of, uh, in the graduate school, originally professor of architecture in UC Berkeley and former president of ERI. And speaking of ERI, I forgot to say one thing. Uh, you corrected me of having the Northridge uh, report in seven days. There is one more correction. The STEER report of Alaska was a joint effort between STEER and ERI. And we will hear more about that in the lunch talk tomorrow. So it should be interesting. So uh, Mary uh, will, uh, will give us the last uh, talk of this uh, session. Uh, and it, it's a very interesting type of uh, looking back and looking forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I clearly never got the memo that we changed the, the peer um, logo from the original <laughs> one. That says something about age. Um, but I'm going to, I knew that Jack would do a lot of technical things. So I'm going to do what Steve Mann always says we do, which is to see things from 30,000 feet. So my talk is a little bit different than the previous two. I tried to have sort of three really big high level lessons from Northridge. Three things that we did um, in the last 25 years and three things that we need to do looking forward. So that's the sort of the outline. So three big lessons. Modern buildings are still vulnerable. We, we learned a lot from Northridge, and Jack showed you many of those things, and we particularly learned a lot even about residential buildings, which we had somewhat discounted the wood frame construction before that. But even, we're still learning from this, and I think this is a really important lesson. I mean, the, the recent events in New Zealand, particularly Kaikoura, and the losses in Wellington in um, precast concrete floors and brand new buildings that are now all being demolished is pretty shocking for us um, in this community. And I think we have to be humble enough to recognize that we are still gonna be learning from these things um, in future earthquakes and we really need to be vigilant. Uh, the second really important lesson from Northridge, in addition to being surprised by the damage in wood frame <laughs> was just how significantly housing damage was undercounted sort of systematically um, and across the board in past earthquakes. Um, and really has a tendency to continue to be undercounted. And I think it's important because these, this chart on the top is the, you know, what we knew about tagging maybe, 
I don't know, a couple of weeks after the earthquake. The problem is the tag colors change over time and the building department doesn't track if there was a building that started out as a red tag and became green tag or started out as a yellow and became red. We, we don't know those things. So in fact, we really don't know what the actual, you know, we don't know what we saw and what we didn't see and we don't know them by address. So we really don't know what we saw and didn't see. And we realize when we look at things like insurance claims on residential buildings, well, we counted something like, um, you know, these were units, 300,000, you know, multifamily units, but, and, and 64,000 sort of single family homes, but we had almost 300,000 FEMA grants to homes. We had almost 200,000 insurance claims worth $12.5 billion. Guess what? We never looked at all that residential damage after the earthquake. We never counted it. And to this day, we have no idea what the real numbers were for Northridge. Jack Boatwright and I have, from USGS, recently sadly passed away, have spent more time than anyone ever wants to think about trying to figure out these numbers. And we just don't know is the answer. And the same was true on multifamily. And I think that going forward, it tells us, you know, we had to pay a lot more attention. It was also the very first time that we actually geospatially mapped that damage and we coordinated it with social science data. We never had sort of economic, um, issues oh, and, and social issues overlaid before. It was a, at the, you know, at the, in Pasadena where we were, all the data was being collected. It was the first time we were making those kinds of integrated maps. So the third lesson from Northridge is that Northridge, you know, we thought it was a big event for us, but it was not the big one. I mean, it was just such a small event compared to what the potential losses are from a major Hayward Fault scenario, a major um, Puente Hills scenario, um, John, in, you know, in, in Los Angeles. Um, and when we look at what's happened since, that very relatively short recovery period that happened in Northridge and Wenchuan and in Chile, those are the anomalies. They, those are not the norm. The norm is it takes 10 to 20 years for a community to recover. And these are just a few examples. Um, and we could, I can do it for just about every earthquake that's happened historically and come up with the same data. So recovery is slowed by a, the complex disruption of urban systems. When you have the, the damage kind of distributed and not heavy urban systems lost, power, water, infrastructure, it's easier. Um, but also the greater the number of concentrated damage makes it slower to recover. So we've learned those, that, that was a huge and important lesson. Recovery <laughs> wasn't something we studied in the same way we studied emergency management. We paid attention to damage, we paid attention to emergency, we, we, we learned from Northridge that we have to think about recovery. So what are the three biggies that we really did learn about in the last 25 years. The first is obviously mitigation. It was critical for loss reduction. And we made, in California, we made huge public investments in seismic upgrades and in research. Um, and it really was true not just in California because we had the Cole Bay earthquake a year later and, you know, that, it changed everything in the world, e-defense was built, etc. So we were part of the research wave that came about, but we also saw the state, Caltrans, investing in the bridges and in the freeways and in lots of research as well as in the retrofits. We saw bond issues for the BART system. We've seen um, a lot of retrofit of public buildings, not only ones that were damaged, like San Francisco City Hall and LA City Hall, but also UC Berkeley putting and starting the Disaster Resistant Universities program, which then became a sort of a national effort. So all of those things really grew with mitigation, grew because of Northridge. And it was really coupled with an understanding of downtime. This is a goofy slide, I couldn't figure out what picture to show. Um, and it was a little study that I did a long time ago 
where we looked at how recovery time increased with the percentage of the stock closed. Um, and the important thing about that was that those, the more, the greater proportion of your building stock, if you're a city, right, and you have 50% of your building, if you're, of your c central business district closed, it's a much bigger downtime than if you have 5% of your CDBG, CD central business district closed, but the dis damage is more distributed across other places. You really saw this in the Christchurch earthquake, obviously, um, was one of the examples of that. Um, and so this, the notion that downtime, that the time factor, uh, and Halid mentioned this in his introduction, time is really important and it's <coughs> become something we have learned about and we are, you know, we learned how to define it, we learned how to model it, we learned how to talk about it, we've learned how to put it into our standards, etc. So the third big lesson in the past 25 years is, is I think that we have really, we started with performance-based engineering and we made enormous progress in that, but we have also done something else, which is that we have taken performance-based engineering from the sort of the shake table and the system to the building, to the campus, and I think now to the whole community, to the city, to the notion that we are, we are not talking about the performance of just, well we are, we're talking about the performance of this building, but we're also talking about the performance of UCLA, and we're also talking about the performance of the capacity of Los Angeles to recover and function after an earthquake. So this is another way of showing that same slide with some diagrams, but these are some of the things we've done technically, and the point is that we integrate that with these, <coughs> um, with other kinds of models, with urban growth models, with cellular autonomous models, with um, event tree models, et cetera, because it's that combination of models from other disciplines and our technical models that are giving us this larger framework. Which leads us to the last real lesson of the last 25 years, which was the beginning of what we are calling resilience planning. Um, we have very specific examples in the last 25 years um, with the, what happened in San Francisco and Los Angeles, um, the sort of introduction of resilience plans, of work with the uh, 100 resilient cities, uh, there's a lot, LA Water and Power's long range 50 year plan for making the water system more resilient, these are all came about because of this transition. So um, if we want to really understand resilience, it's this Bit, what is it? You know, what is this buzzword that's everybody's doing it and nobody knows what it is? We, we've been talking about it at Pierre for a long time. We still talk about it. And we are, we wave, I wave my arms a lot. That's what I do. Um, but it's this, they, the, the definition is this capacity to survive and adapt what kind, no matter what kind of chronic stress. So we know it's a buzzword. Everybody seems to want to do something about it. But Let's break, for us, there are three components. There's the research, and there's the policy, and there's the implementation. We do the research. Somebody else does the policy and the implementation. Not that we shouldn't talk to them, but we're the ones doing the research. Let's think about our part in this, not what everybody else is doing. It's much simpler. If we just, I mean, it's complicated enough just to do our part, so let's just talk about that. Um, I think there are two technical, <coughs> two questions for the technical community. How do we evaluate performance of a whole building and design and, and the building and the design for infrastructure systems both existing and new and for buildings both existing and new to significantly reduce losses in order to simplify and shorten recovery time. This is a change. This means structural and non-structural systems. This means the whole building functioning, not ceiling tiles down and us not able to have class in here. This means the water actually still comes on, the power still comes on. How do we model the interdependencies, which is an even harder problem among the systems, to reflect long-term performance? I think these are our research questions for the 25 years going forward. And this is Greg Deerline's slide, we, there was a, a NIST workshop and a, 
Greg and I <laughs> had to sat on the steering committee, which worked us way too hard, um, for um, a, a study that said, what would it take for us to do residential and commercial buildings to, um, to a in immediate occupancy standard? And, you know, of course, this is about limiting loss and reducing, um, but we can't have resilience, one building at a time, one bridge at a time, even one city at a time. If we want to be resilient in California, if we want our economy to do well, we have to think more broadly. So for us, can we devise resilience metrics? You know, is that possible? Can we model dynamic vulnerability over time? Different, how, how buildings grow and change over time? What do we know about those? These are both. This is some work from Christ after Christchurch with Ken Elwood. This is some work from David Lalamont, who was at Stanford, is now in Singapore. Um, I think there's some really interesting work going on in New Zealand, um, looking at both why this sort of larger systems and functions matter. They have um, a project called Smart Seismic Cities, and it's really trying to look at the technical components, but, at, but linked with all <coughs> of the, the um, community actors, really, link, really deeply integrated with the city, the business owners, the building owners, um, people who are real stakeholders who have a part. And they're really, it is about trying to Im not just imp improve that building code, but to make sure that the community and the city functions. And that's going to require some hard thinking about well, how do you do new construction and what do you do with older buildings and which ones do you retrofit and which ones do you just buy insurance for? Um, similarly, I have another s project on the Alpine Fault looking at all of the interdependencies and the infrastructure. And, I, and they're getting, again, the, sta the true stakeholder participation and data sharing, et cetera. I'm down to my last slide, or two slides. Um, so that is, I think that's a model for thinking about how we go forward. I, I see that in the, in the goal that Khalid put up this morning, but I think you need more on the, and your, I would put a third bullet point up there about this, all this interdependencies work. That would be my recommendation. The infrastructure matters because of this interdependence. We can't, you know, we're, we're gonna function on the, we're gonna, do with the physical part, but all those physical things, the energy, the communication, the dams, um, the, the, all those pieces we design link to our food and agriculture, to our government, to our banking, to our information technology. So we need them to, be, to work together. And for Norm and for all of you guys in the geotech side, in the seismology and geotech side, we have got to figure out how to get this good data into land use planning. We really have, land use planning has punted since Northridge. Nothing has happened in planning very much. And that's a shame. We really have to start to think about parcel-based data. And it's not going to be easy, clearly. It's technically difficult. But it is how we're going to start to get real risk information into the public sphere. So the last slide. What, a, what we should be focusing on is safe and functional physical environments. This is our three-part kind of exercise and where I think our framework for resilience should be. The parts about equity and social and ecological re responsibility, about policy implementation, we shouldn't be ignoring them, but we should understand that we have colleagues in other d fields who are going to really focus on these issues, and we need to talk to them and coordinate with them, but we do not need to do all their other parts. So when we think about resilience, let's focus on the part that we can have some input into. And with that, I think we have a lot to do in the next 25 years. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Uh, any quick one for Mary? Comment? Well, thank you. Uh, according to schedule, we are 20 minutes behind the schedule. Uh, that's time for break. But we are not going to shorten the break. So maybe you make it 25 minutes instead of 30. Because in the next session, we are missing uh, one.
talk uh, because of the government shutdown. Uh, <laughs> the for USGS cannot join us. So we have a less uh, talk. I mean, uh, John is going to moderate this uh, session. Uh, so you still can enjoy the coffee break for, let's say, 25 minutes instead of 30. Uh, and uh, we'll see you here back in. Uh, <laughs>